and welcome to another Sales Pop panel discussion. We are delighted today to have such a great panel to discuss this great topic of negotiations, the neglected sales skill. So while you are participating in this, uh, if you have a question, a comment, an insight, please put it in the question uh, area there. And if it's pertinent to what we're talking about at the time, we will uh, we will take that immediately. Um, if not, we'll take it at the end. But please do uh, feel free to to uh, get involved. So my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, and. Uh, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, salespop.net. I encourage you to uh, subscribe and uh, and check that out. Our panelists today are all contributors to this. There are oh, nearly 400 uh, global thought leaders who contribute um, interviews, blog content, etc., to Sales Pop. So it's a great resource that you should definitely take advantage of. And brought to you also by Pipeliner CRM, the world's most visual CRM. Again, you can take a free trial and you should check it out. It might change your mind about CRM for Forever. Okay, so I wanted to introduce our guests, but what I'd do, what I'd like them to do, is actually introduce themselves, uh, because um, I think it's better that they talk rather than I just uh, read off their bios, and they can uh, it, uh, give you more information about themselves more pertin pertinently. So how about we start off with Jane? Uh, Jane, why don't you introduce yourself and tell the attendees a little bit about you? Hello, my name is Jane Gentry. I'm out of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I've had my practice since 99 and uh, working predominantly with Fortune 500 companies, but in the last year and a half, we've decided to make a shift into mid-market, um, which is such a growing community of, uh, of leaders and salespeople who are really passionate about what they do and are passionate about growing and, and we're just excited to help them. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, and Tony. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> so I'm just having my morning coffee. I just dropped off my kids at school, so I'm just kind of getting into reality right now. Uh, so Tony Perzo, uh, I'm a negotiation uh, expert, um, subject matter expert, and uh, trainer and speaker. And I've had the uh, the good fortune of training uh, some of the biggest companies uh, in the world, um, companies uh, such as. Um, uh, Apple and Red Bull and Samsung and Intel and Microsoft and uh, Pepsi, Taco Bell, Rolls Royce and Boeing. The list goes on and on. And um, yeah, and I'm just uh, happy to uh, be here today. Excellent. I'd say you'd be hard pushed to drive your Rolls Royce through a Taco Bell drive-in, right? Okay. Um, it would be. <laughs> all right. And Samantha? Thanks for having me. I'm I'm really excited. I have um, probably done negotiation my entire life. My father would say I came out of the womb negotiating um, <laughs> to wrap his, you know, wrap him around my little finger. I'm not sure that's completely true, but um, have really enjoyed a, a long career, um, both on the sales and marketing side. I started my career doing channel sales, um, and then I transitioned into marketing and six years ago founded my own business. One of the things that I find really interesting is we spend a lot of time thinking about how to negotiate with our customers, and that's really important. But a lot of the most difficult negotiating I've done and the skills that I apply to those customer communications has been internally um, and really trying to uh, do things around securing budgets and prioritizing activities and all kinds of things. And then if that's not enough, I'm the mother of four boys. So you can imagine all the negotiating that comes into my household when it comes to uh, TV time or movies we want to go watch and all kinds of fun things like that. I love it. Thanks, Samantha. Um, and just to let you know that we're all over the States today. Jane's in Atlanta. Samantha's in Boston. Tony's up the road for me in Los Angeles, and I'm here in San Diego. So before we get kicked off, I just wanted to quickly launch a poll to get an idea of what the role is uh, for from the people who are attending today. So if you would just take a moment and select which uh, role uh, suits you best or uh, describes you best it'll uh, it's always interesting for us as we get into the um, into the discussion to know our audience okay we have uh, about three quarters of you have voted so far so um, if uh, I just give it another couple of moments we'll see if we can get close to uh, 
the majority uh nearly 100 percent. okay um all right i'm gonna i'm gonna close the poll in just one moment here and then i will display the results so everybody can see okay so let's share the results here um as you can see so about 29 percent sales person sales leader so um, over 50% are sales and about 30% uh, are in executive positions. Excellent. Okay. That's very good. All right. So let's actually get straight into the discussion. And I thought I'd just ask, start off with a foundational question here. And maybe this one uh, we could start off with, uh, with Jane taking. So do you believe negotiating is its own skill or is this, uh, is it just a, another part of the sales process? Like it's a skill, but it's, it's a, it's a skill on a par with all the other skills you need in the, in the sales process, or is it really a skill in and of itself that you have to focus on and develop? No, I, I think it is a skill, John. And, and interestingly enough, um, I'd be interested about Tony. I, I bet you Tony and I get called into uh, companies for different kinds of negotiating scenarios. When I get called by a client, it's usually because uh, situations with their customers have not been resolved at the right uh, level in the company and have been escalated to a point where a senior vice president or a general manager is giving money back to a customer. And so oftentimes we are in an organization helping sellers and other client facing people for that matter, understand that negotiating is something that they do every single day, many, many times a day. And those mini negotiations are the things that set them up for where what most of us think of as negotiation, which is that that moment when we're at, at a table with a customer on the other side and a contract in between us. So I feel pretty strongly that it is, it's a critical skill to not just have the ability to negotiate, but the ability to recognize when we are negotiating every day. Excellent. And um, Tony, why don't you pick that up? Yes, absolutely. It's, um, it's uh, it's a skill. Um, it comes down to uh, the listening. So I mean, you could be listening when you're with a with a uh, a customer or a prospect. There's a listening involved. So there's the listening of a salesperson, and um, and a lot of salespeople are are not even good at listening as a salesperson, right? So that's listening as a salesperson is a, is is a skill. Uh, trying to identify the pain points of the prospect and trying to figure out how you can be a solution. But then there's also uh, a listening as a negotiator. And I think uh, I think at its core, salespeople need to start listening in uh, to their conversations with their with with prospects and potential buyers. They need to listen into those conversations as a salesperson and as a negotiator. And um, so I think it, it all comes down to that because if you under if you learn how to play the game of negotiation, if you start understanding the skills that are required to become an effective negotiator, you'll start listening to your conversations uh, with your with your buyers with with different ears. You'll start things will start popping out at you that would have never popped out at you before you acquired these negotiation skills. Um, and you know I have clients where. I'm training their sales force, and I, over a six-month period, every month I give them a new mock or practice negotiation, and I see I see salespeople um, start off horrible, um, awful at negotiating, and I think John, you and I have had this conversation that most people think that they're pretty amazing negotiators until we start opening it up and putting a, a figurative spotlight on the right. choices they're making in mock negotiations, and all of a sudden they start seeing, wow. I'm leaving a lot of money on the table and I'm not even aware of it. And I'm taking sales forces through this uh, six month period where the negotiations I give them get more and more complex. And I see them doing a hell of a lot better. I see salespeople becoming skilled before my very eyes. And this is not, and, 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 and the stuff that I'm teaching them is not theory based. It's all practical skills 
that are very easy that a, a six-year-old, my kids can use. Yeah. And, I think, uh, go I ahead, think John. no, I was going to say, I think that's the big point is, is practice. How about you, Samantha? What do you think about this in terms of a, of a skill? Hey, Samantha? Must be on on mute. Okay, we'll come back to Samantha. I think uh, she must have. We must have lost her audio for a minute. Um, I wanted to. I wanted to. I wanted to move on and um, start talking about. I mean, sometimes it's a good point. It's a good place to start. Is to, as Tony said. You know, a lot of people, we all think we're amazing negotiators until a spotlight is shined on it. So um, sometimes it's good to look back and, and say, OK, what are some of the common mistakes sellers make when they are when they're negotiating? So maybe, Jane, if you want to start off with that one. Sure. Um, if I have to pick one for this short call, I would say it's around empathy. Um, and John, you and I've talked in the past about the way that we assess salespeople. And one of the things that we look for is, um, is empathy, but also uh, their need to be liked, which means they have too much empathy, right? And so mm -hmm. if you have too much empathy, then you are completely on the customer side of the table and you are likely um, consistently giving away things that you shouldn't be giving away or don't have to be giving away. So one of the errors I think that we run into is um, salespeople that have too much of a need to be liked. Then mm -hmm. they don't ask difficult questions. They don't ask enough questions and they're, and they're giving, giving things away. On the other side of that then would be um, not enough empathy. Right. So if you don't have enough empathy with the customer, then you're not asking the kinds of questions that really get you to what motivates that customer or what's important to that customer. What will make them feel like they have a win? And to Tony's point, if you're not if you don't have any empathy and you're not asking those questions, you're also not listening. You know, you you have nothing to listen to if you don't ask great questions. Um, but if you don't listen, you can't ask great questions, right? So, yeah. so for me, I would say it's this balance. Um, the mistake people make is being too heavy on one end or the other of of empathy and not having that flexibility during some of those some of those difficult conversations that you're having with your customers. Yeah, no, no, absolutely, Jane. I agree. I think sometimes it's um, it's definitely, uh, you know, because they built the relationship during the sales process, got the momentum going, everything is great, and it comes to a negotiation, as you say, you know, they're maybe just reluctant to to ask hard questions or to to get down into it for fear of uh, impacting the relationship. But you know, it's a negotiation. Um, Samantha. Uh, sure. Yeah, oh, great. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah, we can hear you again. Yeah. So what what are some of the common common mistakes do you think sellers make when negotiating? I think there are two very common things that happen um and I even have to practice not falling into these traps myself. So one of them is um we listen very well and then sometimes we believe everything we're told by our buyer by our champion. And the reality is they don't often understand how to buy within their organization. And mm -hmm. so we have to help coach them through that process oftentimes, unless they're a very experienced buyer. Um, and that, you know, that I'd say half the time, the person who's my primary buyer hasn't bought anything significant from the company in quite a while. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, a common challenge. And I think the other common challenge is not being able and willing to walk away. Um, this has to be a win-win situation for both the person I'm selling something to and my own organization. And we have to be able and willing to say it's not a good fit right now or it's not a good fit at all um, and not lose our power when we are too desperate or too worried. We have monthly numbers. We have quarterly numbers. We sometimes get caught up in those. The very successful salespeople that I know play the long game. And by playing the long game and building up their pipeline sufficiently, 
they are able to say no to any one deal at any given time. And that gives them an incredible amount of flexibility and power in that discussion that they don't have otherwise. Yeah, no, great points, uh, Samantha, and I particularly like that one about uh, the fact is that your buyer on the other side of the table may either not have bought for a while, may not understand their even internal buying process. So you may be negotiating with somebody who doesn't even have the power to completely negotiate the deal or whatever. Um, how about you, Tony? What do you think some of the mistakes, what are some of the common mistakes you see sellers making? Well, I mean, definitely lack of preparation. So there's a lot of salespeople. Most salespeople are, are going, most companies are putting their margins in the hands of salespeople who are going out, hoping for the best and just winging it and shooting from the hip and have absolutely no strategy or plan on how they're going to conduct themselves in that negotiation. So definitely uh, there's a lack of planning. And then this big word, you know, Sir Francis Bacon said that, that negotiation is to work, to discover and to take risk. And risk is such a huge word because all of negotiation is risky. There's nothing that's going to work 100% in negotiation. And salespeople have got to start learning how to take a little bit more risk in their negotiations and not playing it safe all, this, all the time. Uh, the salespeople who can begin taking more risk will do a lot better. And when I say risk, um, I mean being able to uh, aim a little bit higher in their negotiations, being able to dig their heels in a little bit more, taking some chances, uh, maybe saying no. That's another one. Uh, salespeople have this weird thing about saying no. No, as you probably know, John, is one of the mm -hmm. most important words you can say in a negotiation. I think it's the most important. Start saying no. No is not going to push people away. In fact, no in a negotiation actually brings more people towards you. People mm -hmm. like to work a little harder in a negotiation. People don't like to get things too easy in a negotiation. If you say if you say no to someone first and then say yes to them, they'll be a lot more satisfied um, after the negotiation because you put up a little resistance first. So no is a very important word. Being able to walk out of a negotiation using a take it or leave it offer or walking away, not at the end when it really is um, the end of the deal, but maybe a little bit closer to the beginning of a negotiation is very risky, but can be very effective. Salespeople have got to start training their buyers how to treat them in a negotiation. And if you're always someone who gives stuff away for free, who gives concessions away for free, who gives discounts away for free without asking for things in return, guess what? Your buyers can be taking handfuls of those 5% discounts for the rest of your life until <laughs> you start putting up a little resistance and using an age-old negotiation strategy, you know, trading or asking for uh, buying a string or asking for something in return. Until mm -hmm. you start the risk of using these basic tactics, you're going to be a dead duck in negotiations. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. And I think that's a, it's a key point that uh, has been raised by a number of people. I think the saying no, the having the confidence to to walk away, and I think having the confidence to hold your ground um, if you really believe in your product and you believe in the value that it's going to bring to the buyer. Um, okay, so. I mean, let's face it, um, there's a lot about negotiations uh, that can be set up earlier in the sales process, right? If you, if there are things that you can do early in the sales process that make sure that the negotiation down the road can be much smoother. So I maybe start with Samantha again this time. Um, what are some of the things you think salespeople can do early in the sales process to ensure that the negotiation will be smoother later on? I'm really glad you asked that question because, it, you know, I know we write up on the board, right? Here's a sales or a buying process and there's a stage called negotiation. But the reality is we should be negotiating from the almost the very first interaction. And obviously the type of negotiating we're doing early in this process is not debating price, right? It's not debating terms of a purchase, but it's understanding what that customer's goals are and what the time frame by which they have to meet those goals are and helping them create and quantify those things. Because if we can do that upfront in the process and we can start to define the value that they're going to get out of this or that they need to get out of this, when we get to the end where we start talking about the actual price and actual terms, the hard work should pretty much have been done and it should be an exercise in you know, paperwork and process at that point. Um, and I find that a much more seamless process. And sometimes that means walking away from opportunities fairly early where we don't think it's a good fit. But I rather know that up front 
then spend a lot of cycles with someone for which we can't drive a quantified value to them. So my best advice and what I try and practice is really from the very, very beginning to be really helping them understand why doing this thing, whether it's buying a product, using your service, attending your workshop, whatever it is, is going to help them. And if they can't articulate it to you and you can't step them to a point where they can say why, they're probably not going to be in a good position. You're not going to be able to negotiate a fair price down the road. Excellent. Yes, I agree. Um, and I think it's a good point that you can raise later in the negotiations. You can revisit some of those earlier conversations and kind of remind um, the buyer about some of the things that they raised as, as issues or things that they needed solved and how, you know, your, your, your solution can do that. How about you, Jane? What are some early stage best practices? Yeah, you know, as I said already, John, I think negotiating happens from day one. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there are, are a couple of things that make a great negotiator. One is they're outstanding at discovery early mm -hmm. on in the process. They're asking uh, the right kinds of questions. They're asking hard questions. They understand at the end of discovery what the status quo is for the customer they understand what their problems are. They understand what great is going to look like. And they have dug deep enough to know what the motivators are. So for me, then the biggest skill for, um, for a salesperson early on is what I call redirection. And it's that ability to continue to probe beyond not just accept the first thing that you hear from a customer, mm -hmm. but continue to probe until you really get to their motivation. So that, that's one thing. The second thing is, uh, I think you set yourself up well for negotiating by getting many yeses from a customer or a prospect from the very first conversation. Get them to say yes a lot of times to small things. Uh, sets them up for that big yes at the end. And what we find when we study salespeople is that the best sellers, the best negotiators, score very poorly in the closing competency. Mm. And uh, clients usually get very confused by that. And they go, oh, Jane, this is one of my top guys. Why does it yeah. say that he's not a closer? And what it means is that that seller has been closing from the very first conversation. They don't need the closing competency because right. they've been getting the customer to say yes all along the sales process. Yeah, I, I, I love that piece of advice, getting yeses from the get-go, small yeses, getting the, the, getting the buyer into the habit of seeing that you're bringing, you know, you're bringing insight, you're bringing value and ma making it easy when the big yes, you say, when you ask for the big yes. How about you, Tony? What are some things you can do very early on? Because I know this is a, an area where you, you also believe that the, the preparation for the negotiation starts at the very beginning, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, there, there's a lot of things we can do, but I guess the first thing that is coming to my mind when, you know, when I conduct these, these, these practice negotiations and I've had, you know, I've had tens of thousands of people um, do my negotiations where I then critique them. Mm -hmm. What I, when, when, when I see teams and I, I consider every single one of these practice negotiations that I conduct a mini experiment. And when I see teams deadlock, when they don't come to an agreement, um, the uh, the first question I always ask them is, did you guys even like each other? <laughs> uh, and uh, not, not in real life, but in this make-believe life, in this case study I set up for you guys, did you guys even like each other during the negotiation? And nine times out of ten, when teams deadlock, it comes down to the teams not even liking each other. Um, and when I show when I, I show that when I show the most each team was willing to pay or take. Uh, they should have had, there was a crossover, so they should have had a settlement, but they didn't have a settlement because their own stuff got in the way, their own ego got in the way. Uh, emotion came into the uh, the negotiation, anger, they got frustrated. So all of a sudden, the deal, the sale, what they're being paid, salespeople are being paid to sell, right? And what they're being paid to do they even, didn't even come to fruition because they were so stuck in between their own head on their own feelings and emotions. So... Uh, one of the things that I say at the beginning is you want to start creating a climate of agreement right at the beginning, and that's a skill in itself. So how can you be tough in a negotiation? How can you say no? How can you hold your own ground, but at the same time, not tick the other party off? 
Mm -hmm. And of course, there's a lot of things and there's a lot of strategies that we can use in order to do that. But I think those are those are the two kind of strategies that salespeople need to start learning how to be tough, how to say no, but how to say no while also bringing the other party closer to uh, an agreement with you and keeping the other party comfortable and and deflecting any sort of emotion from coming into the picture. Excellent. And that's a neat, a neat uh, segue into our next question. And uh, and maybe, Jane, you want to start with this. So, OK, when you get you get through the whole process and hopefully you've got your yeses and all of that along the way, um, when a salesperson approaches the final negotiation phase, I think, as, as Tony was describing there, I think sometimes it becomes a tense, you know, they become tense, maybe the mood changes a little, maybe the way people are interacting changes a little. So how should a salesperson really approach the final negotiation phase to make it as po- as positive as possible? Yeah, we bring all of that, um, all that emotion, all that angst, mm-hmm. all that desperation, the fear um, of having that hard conversation. And so there are two things that I think uh, might be helpful for your listeners. The first one is uh, in your preparation, I agree with Tony 100% on that, preparation is key. I want you to think of this, the negotiation from the third story. And what I mean by that is I bring my story to the table and you bring your story to the table. But what is the story that a third party who has no skin in the game, how do they describe the situation? It takes the emotion. um, it, It helps to kind of tone down the emotion a little bit in that conversation and and the scenario that I usually give people which totally ages me is um is the odd couple you know um Tony thought or or, you know the one guy thought the other guy was a complete slob the other guy thought that you know the first one was anal retentive but the, the third story might be you guys really have different approaches to how you um manage uh, the things in your apartment or manage cleanliness. So what, it, what is that third story? And the second thing would be, um, I like to start with what I call the 100% rule. And that is, can I find one thing to start the, to start the conversation with that the client and I can agree on 100%? So we start that conversation um, on the same side of the table with with a yes, with something that we can both agree on, uh, even if it is something as simple as, uh, you know, agreeing that we both want them to be hugely successful uh, right. with whatever the end game is, right? But find that one thing to start the conversation where you can both agree uh, 100%. Excellent. And how about you, Samantha? How should a salesperson set themselves up for the uh, negotiation phase or set themselves and the buyer up for success in the negotiation phase? I really like that uh, Jane's notion of find, you know, starting with something that you can 100% with clarity agree on. I do think starting from a point of how this serves everyone is is very real. I'm a really transparent person and I think that serves well. So um, when we're, you know, having this conversation, I I think it's really helpful to say, hey, my, you know, my goal, our goal, based on when your project timeline is for this deal to close at this point in time. And we, and you know, and, and we need to make, you know, this amount of margin and what we're doing. And here's the value. Here's the criteria you said you were going to use when you we're going to make a decision. And here's how we've addressed that criteria and be really, really honest and super transparent. We may meet 80 percent of the criteria, not 100 percent of the criteria. And I find the customers who have um, are drawn to the people who are most honest. So I'm in a highly competitive situation and there is a, another salesperson, you know, making everything sound perfect and rosy. And I'm telling them, here's the hard, what the hard part is going to be and how we're going to help you through the hard part. I hear over and over and over again, how refreshing that is. And it's far more rare than it should be. Um, so I'm a big believer in just being super transparent, being positive, talking about what you have been talking about all along, reminding them why they're doing this and identifying areas of gap to so they can know up front what those things are and know that you're going to be a partner for, with them 
throughout the whole process. And by the way, a little chocolate therapy goes a long way. Oftentimes our <laughs> buyers are struggling, right, within themselves. So have some empathy. They may want to do this. They're all set to go. They have a budget. They have a purchasing person who makes them get three bids or does this or does that. Mm -hmm. And so just being sympathetic to the process that they're going through and being supportive of that is incredibly helpful. And instead of what we often want to do, which is say, I don't want to sign another piece of paper. Or I don't want to look at another thing. Mm -hmm. I don't want to add another step. Um, sometimes our customers have to add another step. They have to have six more people look at things. It's frustrating. It's annoying. It probably shouldn't be that way, um, but it is. So um, just be empathetic to that situation and be so, as supportive and transparent and open as we can. Yeah, I, I agree. I think sometimes we forget um, that, you know, especially B2B purchasing decisions, it, a lot can weigh on the decision and the person who makes that decision or is identified with purchasing that product or service. If it doesn't work out, it can be career limiting. If it does work out, it can be career enhancing. So there's a lot of emotion tied up. So, Tony, how do you think a, a salesperson should set up the negotiation phase like before they even get into it? What are some of the things that they should do to make sure that that it's going to be a, a a good process. Well, I mean, at the end, if if uh, anybody listening, uh, if they email me, I'll, I'll send them two documents that uh, I think are essential in in helping uh, salespeople uh, properly uh, to be effective in the negotiation phase. And one of them is is I call it a power ledger. It doesn't take long to do. It's identifying what your leverage is. So I I I know this for certainty that most salespeople think they have less power than they actually do. Most salespeople think the buyer has holds all the cards. They will have all the marbles. And salespeople are generally, unless they've identified where their leverage is, they go into negotiations uh, thinking that they need to make the deal. They don't, they don't have much leverage in this negotiation. And what winds up happening in those situations is they wind up making big concessions right off the bat, which sends the wrong message to their buyer, right? They're not making stingy, tight little concessions. And uh, they start discounting way too early when they don't have to. So if salespeople do about a 20 minute exercise and go through the 10 power sources that are in every negotiation and identify, oh, I have the power source here or my buyer has a power source here, I ensure them that after they do this exercise, they're gonna realize that they have a lot more check marks on their side of the power ledger than they thought they had. And that will give the salesperson more confidence and they'll be less likely to make bad choices, dumb decisions and big concessions when they go into the negotiation phase. The second document is a planning guide. So just filling out a planning guide um, will bring up a lot. So understanding what your objective is in that negotiation that you're about to go into. So getting clarity around that and then understanding what your priority issues are and having, you know, and, and what what is your and what what is your what do you want with that priority issue? What's your expectation? What's your walkway price? And doing that same activity exercise for your buyers. What, what are their priority issues and what do they want and what's their uh, walkaway price or walkaway position? Just a quick example. I had, uh, I had a client, with a, I was, I was uh, consulting with a salesperson who said that their priority issue was to, to, uh, to, to close this client at 300 tons a year. But they'd be willing to uh, close them at 12. Their walkaway position was 1,200 tons a year. And he wrote down as their buyer's priority issue that the buyer's priority issue was the most that they wanted to buy was 80 tons a year. So here we have a so here on his own planning guide, he had my buyer only wants to buy 80 tons a year, and our walkaway price is 1,200. Uh, our <laughs> our walkaway is 1,200 tons. That's a huge gap already, and the negotiation hasn't even begun. So by seeing that gap, I was able to show him you're going into a negotiation that if you approach it with a competitive uh, in, in a competitive way where you're just saying, please give me 1200, please give me 1200, please give me 1200. And the buyer's saying, well, we just want 80. We just want 80. You're dead before the negotiation has even begun. So in those type of situations, it's good to be able to say, well, ha, huh, what are some creative ways we can close this gap and bring those creative ways into the negotiation? And that only comes about because he filled out his planning guide with me. So mm -hmm. I would think all companies need to start planning, especially for important negotiations. They need to start planning as a team and filling out these power ledgers and planning guides as a team and then withholding the authority to negotiate until this planning guide has been done and it gets signed off by some sort of um, manager or director within the organization. Yeah. No, I, I agree, Tony. I think the the 
planning um, planning for each phase of, of the process is is critical. Um, what I wanted to do next, okay, so that's setting you up. During during the negotiation itself, right? What are some best practices um, for just having the process itself go smooth? And maybe even if it's not going smooth, what are some things you can do to get it back on track? Um, Samantha, how about you? What are some things that you can do during the process to keep it moving smoothly? And or if it starts to go off track, what can you do to get it back on? Uh, very good question. I, I think one of the things that tends to happen to salespeople when we move into negotiation is we forget to keep selling. And we start all of our communication becomes on where's the PO and what's that price and is legal signed off in a document. And we forget that we have to continue to add value to that that buyer during the negotiation phase. And so I think the number one thing we do to keep it smooth is to keep the relationship open and, and positive by continuing to do things that are helpful to them. That may be coaching a champion, it may be helping them write the business case in the back end, it may be you know, coaxing your legal team to be more flexible than they were before. It could be a whole, it could be sending them an article that is interesting and relevant to them. It could be a whole bunch of things. So I think number one, continue to add value just because we get to negotiation doesn't mean we're, we stop selling. Um, and the second thing that I think we need to do goes back to something I said earlier is I think we just need to be super transparent and hold each other accountable. So if I say I'm going to do something and I'm going to get back to you within 24 hours, I owe it to them to get back to them in 24 hours. Um, we want to hold our buyers accountable. That means we need to hold ourselves accountable. And sometimes that's easy and sometimes it's difficult. If I have to, if I believe that I want to, for example, extend payment terms, I likely don't have the authority to do that as an individual salesperson. I have to go and negotiate that with a number of people in my company, maybe just my manager, maybe accounting, maybe the CFO. And I need to know what my internal processes are to make those kinds of concessions and those kinds of give and takes. I also need to understand the limitations and the benefits of the products or services that I'm selling so that I can know what I can give and take and I can be really open and transparent with them about it and always have some things in my back pocket. So if I'm asking you for something, I think Tony said this earlier, um, what am I going to give you in exchange for that thing I'm asking for? So I think it goes back to good basic skills of having empathy throughout the entire process, being fully transparent and holding ourselves as accountable as we want our customers to be to the process that we've planned and outlined together. Excellent. And how about you, Jane? What are some of the things that you can do during this, uh, the actual negotiation process itself to keep it on track and to get it back on track if it's going off track? Well, I knew you were going to ask this question, John, and so I, can't, I, I pulled a little, you know, from my top 10 list, I pulled it. Excellent. Or five things from my top 10 list. And the first one is um, understand your own biases around money. So we, we have certain um, numbers that we think are big numbers. And we have certain ways of purchasing things that get in the way of our ability to negotiate. For example, if I am a price shopper, I have a tendency to tolerate that kind of behavior from a customer. So it's helpful to a seller to really kind of get over their money issues and really treat money as any other objective that the customer has to um, has to meet, has a need for, right? The second thing is, is uh, never trade something for nothing. Uh, it, it weakens your position immediately. Instead, find opportunities to expand value. Um, so this may or may not be what Samantha was alluding to, but I think that there's always a way to add something rather than trying to negotiate on money, continuing to add value to that customer throughout mm -hmm. the process. Um, never trade something for nothing, but a sister of that, the yang of that, is never split the difference with a customer. It's the same thing. It weakens your negotiating power. It makes it seem like you didn't have a real number to begin with. Um, I would say move big on small things and small on big things. So mm -hmm. where there are small things that are not important to you, make big concessions to the customer so that when there are big things, you don't have to concede as much. And I guess the final thing would be um, 
there is a point where you need to state that the deal is done. Right. If then, you know, if you do this, we'll do this, you know, all those kinds of conversations. But you have to say at the end, this is a done deal so that there is no opportunity for somebody to try to continue the conversation later, um, you know, by saying I did this with my boss or whatever. There's a point where you have to say we're done. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And how about you, Tony? Well, you know, I have uh, a little bit more of a cynical view um, to uh, to best practices during the negotiation. I've 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 trained procurement uh, teams uh, for a long time, and I can tell you that uh, here in the United States, uh, it's all about cutting costs, and a lot of buyers are using playbooks, negotiation playbooks that are littered with nego buyer tactics to um, to get a better price off you and. Uh, so I think salespeople need to start learning how to defend themselves against buyer tactics. And these are very simple tactics that buyers are using. And a lot of salespeople are falling for them all the time. So I, I don't have, I mean, I, I could spend a whole day on this, but I would say that the number one thing salespeople need to start learning how to do is saying no during the negotiation phase, learning how to put up resistance. Quick example, an overused tactic by buyers, I call it the squeeze. And this is where a buyer pretends that they're your best friend. They love you. We want to do business with you. You guys are fantastic. Salesperson hears this. Salespeople are told 100 times a day, no, 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 no. They're told 1,000 times a day, your competition is a lot cheaper. So salespeople are naturally very insecure about their own pricing. And then a buyer comes in and says, we like you. We want to do business with you. You're fantastic. All of a sudden, the salesperson is thinking, wow, this is actually going well for me. And then the buyer then says, we like you, but, 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 you got to do something about that pricing, right? And right. we call that squeeze. And then, you know what? And this is what salespeople, the majority of salespeople, this is how they respond to a buyer squeeze. The buyer says, we love you. We want to do business with you, but you got to do something about that pricing. And then a salesperson says this, well, where do you need us to be? Which is the worst thing you can say, because all of a sudden <laughs> you send a message to the buyer that there's, move, there's room in my pricing, that I can come down. All of a sudden, you lose credibility because now you're just dropping your price so easily. So there's not a lot of validity mm -hmm. to your opening price. And all thing, all these things have gone wrong because of a message you sent to that buyer. So mm -hmm. I would say best practices for salespeople is to lar start learning what these buyer tactics are. And I can tell you most of the countermeasures to these buyer tactics is this one word, no. And there's many ways to say no, and there's soft versions to no. But salespeople have got to start learning how to put up resistance, playing. I have to start learning how to play hard, play hard to get and have to start learning how to um, not fall for these buyer tactics so easily. Excellent. Thank you. OK, so um, as we're bumping up against time, let's uh, make this a quick one. Um, so maybe start with you, Jane. What should the outcome of a good negotiation look like? And and how you know how how can you judge that this was a good and positive negotiation from both sides? Yeah, we don't hate each other. We still want to work together. Mm -hmm. um, you know, no feelings are hurt. Um, I wanted to. I know we're up against time. And apologies mm -hmm. to Samantha and Tony if they've written books on negotiating. But I wanted to. Um, I'm a big sharer of other people's stuff, and I wanted to just share something with your listeners, John. Yeah. There's a book written by a Stanford um, professor, Margaret Neal, who's in psychology, I think, and a um, Kellogg professor who's a math, math guy. And the book is called Getting More of What You Want, um, Neal and Liss, L-Y-S. And it, it really isn't a book about um, the process of negotiating or how to negotiate as much as it is about the economics of negotiating and the psychology of mm -hmm. negotiating. And, um, and I find it to be a real add to, to any kind of work that we ever do with clients on negotiating and, um, and probably an add to, to what, what your other panelists maybe do. But I think it's interesting to get to the kind of the science of negotiating, because I think a lot of what we do is the art of negotiating. And um, so I hope that's helpful. 
Yeah, absolutely. And we will add that book to the Sales Pop bookstore. So if anybody wants to find it, we'll have it in the Sales Pop bookstore later today. Okay, um, Samantha, uh, at the end, when you take when you finish and you take a step back, how do you know that it was a good positive uh, that it was a good and positive negotiation? You know, for me, this is pretty straightforward. The customer feels that they're getting a product or service that they're excited about and they're looking forward to, and they understand how it's going to impact them. And um, I, as a vendor, have made money, <laughs> right? And, <laughs> yeah. um, and, and, and I'm not apologetic about it, right? We're in business to make money. That's sure. okay. But I don't want anyone to ever feel that they've been ripped off, right? I want that customer to be super excited about what they're doing and feel that they're getting value. And if we have achieved that, if I've made money and my client is excited about moving forward, then we've had a successful negotiation. Excellent. And Tony, you, what, what, is, what should a good negotiation look like when it's over? Well, you know, it's like, I, I think that, you know, negotiation can be very manipulative and a skilled negotiator can make their, their counterpart, they can feel like they're getting a great deal, even though they're getting ripped off. So mm -hmm. negotiation has got to be more than just a warm and fuzzy feeling you have in uh, because eventually, you know, uh, things will go, will go south if you're always manipulating people because of your negotiation skills into thinking. Uh, after getting a good deal. So in my opinion, the um, a good negotiation looks like this. It's uh, when you use negotiation as the breeding ground in order to make the deal bigger than what it was when you first went for the negotiation. So the negotiation becomes a platform where both parties discuss uh, what the possibilities are and they're able to make the deal even bigger through the discussing in the negotiation. So you go in talking A, and then you walk over the negotiation with A, B, and C. So the negotiation kind of acts like a tree that grows branches during the negotiation. And when you walk away from the negotiation, the deal was bigger and better than you ever possibly thought it could have been when you first walked in just talking about price. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes total sense. Thank you. Okay, so what I wanted to do before we finish here is this has been an, a fantastic panel and we've had some great uh, um, great uh, feedback from the people on, on the panel uh, of who, who've joined us today. But can you start off, maybe Jane, first, uh, tell people a little bit more about yourself and where they can contact you. Uh, they can uh, contact me at uh, through the website, janegentry.com, Twitter, at Jane Gentry, LinkedIn, Jane M. Gentry. You're probably seeing a theme here. Uh, <laughs> if you put Jane Gentry into the internet, you're likely to, to run into me. And um, we love working with mid-market organizations in pretty much any industry. We're, we're industry agnostic. We've been in all of them. And uh, we've worked with companies like Coke and Mercedes-Benz and all of the big Fortune 500 companies that you want to sell to. So I think we'd be very helpful. Thanks for having me, John. Yeah, absolutely. And Samantha? You can find me in all the usual places. At Twitter, I'm at Samantha Stone. You can find me at LinkedIn. And of course, um, if you're looking to contact me directly through email or phone, that information is available on unleashpossible.com. So always love meeting new folks and answering follow-up questions and, uh, and sharing ideas. So encourage people to reach out anytime. Great. And Tony? Uh, yeah, TonyPerzo.com. Uh, my website, uh, my email, Tony at TonyPerzo.com. Please email me if you want those two, that power ledger and that planning guide. I'll email it over to you. It'll make a huge difference for you guys uh, listening. And also, if you're interested in uh, learning more about negotiation, I'm doing a uh, two-day seminar, July 13th and 14th. And uh, I'm also live streaming, the whole, uh, live streaming the whole seminar, so you can watch it from anywhere in the world. And uh, if you want to check out more information about that seminar, go to bit.ly slash you suck at negotiating. <laughs> yeah, I forgot Tony has, has the best uh, URLs. Um, okay, well, listen, I want to thank uh, I want to thank our panelists today. I actually took a load of notes myself and uh, some 
got some great insights out of it. This is also being recorded, so everybody who's participated today will get a link with the recording, and anybody who registered and wasn't able to attend will also get the recording. And I really encourage you to share it with other people because I think this is an overlooked and neglected uh, topic of discussion. And I think that uh, Jane, uh, Samantha, and Tony have given us some phenomenal insights and actionable things that we can do. So, again, thank you. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine. That's Sales Pop. Net. I encourage you to go there where you'll find a lot more information, including we'll have that book up um, later and uh, Pipeliner CRM, world's most visual uh, CRM. So thank you again, uh, Jane, Samantha and Tony. And thank you all for attending. And thank you to the people who will listen to the recording. Uh, see you all again for another great panel discussion really soon. Bye now.